Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will go to the second plenary, and that is titled Surgery and Compact. Are they related? So, this session will be chaired by Professor Daniel Fernando. He is the Professor of Surgery in the Faculty of the University of California. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this opportunity given to share, share this session. And Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity given to start this uh, share this session. And we have the privilege of having Professor Michael Griffin with us this afternoon to talk to us about surgery, uh, competitive sports and surgery. Are they related? Now, this is a very, very important topic, and Mike has a particular interest in sports. And uh, to talk, uh, I understand that Professor Griffin uh, has joined us from UK. And uh, good morning to you, Mike. And uh, Mike is a true friend of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka and a true friend of uh, Sri Lanka. So, without much ado, may we have Mike presenting making his presentation. Well, hello and welcome to um, uh, my lecture today. Uh, my name is Professor Michael Griffin. I'm president of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and I'm absolutely delighted to be talking to you from the United Kingdom uh, to you all in Sri Lanka. Um, it's a difficult time for all of us globally, but in particular in the United Kingdom where we are experiencing another lockdown with a huge rise in COVID-19 cases. I do hope and trust that it's much better with you in Sri Lanka as, as we speak. Um, I understand it is better, but um, I understand also that, that cases are rising. Last year was a much happier occasion. Uh, we were in Gaul um, with good friends, good food and good engagement. And um, I had expected to talk about communication uh, during the pandemic. Um, but indeed, um, Jayendra Fernando, your president, um, who here's a picture of him um, entertaining us last year in Colombo, um, a lovely experience. Um, he prevailed upon me uh, to change that talk and talk about the link between sporting ability and surgical careers um, and aptitude. Uh, an interesting topic which I've, I have talked about before but never spoken um, at meetings about. So there are two aspects to this. There is the, the principle that, that we ask, does sporting ability suggest surgical ability? And secondly, can surgery learn from elite sport to improve our own performance? And I therefore postulate three hypotheses uh, to look at over the next 15 minutes. Uh, first of all, that hand-eye coordination from ball sports lends itself to skills in the craft of surgery. Secondly, that playing sport at competitive level produces an element of resilience and mental strength under pressure. And thirdly, there are things we can learn from sport that can improve overall surgical performance. And I think that I need to do a couple of disclaimers. First of all, I am not a medical educationist, far from it. Um, I have headed up our exams for the whole of um, the United Kingdom, but I am still not an educationist. And secondly, I'm not now an elite sportsman. Um, I love sport, played sport, a lot of sport in my time and still follow it, but I'm not now an elite sportsman. <laughs> so does sporting ability suggest um, surgical ability? Well, Sport is all per pervasive uh, in society and no less so amongst us surgeons. The well-recognized various skills and aptitudes that sport confers translates very easily into surgery, but perhaps no less 
in other areas like musicianship, playing the piano and, and other arts. Uh, and I refer you to the first paper um, written by Gilles Como um, this year about pianists having an advantage when learning surgical skills. However, in trying to select out examples in sport amongst the surgical community seems to be a good deal easier in sport than it is in the, in the arts. And rugby does seem to be a favoured sport amongst surgeons. More and more, the mutual demands of professionalism sadly create an, an almost insuperable challenge to achieving excellence in both. And nor does a particular surgical specialty seem to confer any advantage. And sadly, all of my research confirms that there's no Sri Lankan or Indian surgeon who has played international cricket. I look forward to being put right about that, but I'm pretty sure about it. So having good hand-eye coordination and manual dexterity is to a certain extent related to having better practical skills ability. And this study, um, the last study, the impact of video games on training surgeons in the 21st century indicates that relatively simple tasks, such as hand tying, um, knot tying, um, and continuous suturing are performed equally well by all. But when the tasks become more complex and complicated, it appears that those with the extra skills gained through recreational hobbies, such as uh, ball sports, playing instruments, and video games, they have an advantage and perform significantly better. So, wh where is the advantage here? And do we see this in individuals who have been surgeons? And Dr. Joshua Pym, who's shown here with the Wimbledon trophy, um, playing, um, playing tennis, he actually won the singles and doubles for all Ireland, and he won the Wimbledon titles in 1893 and 1894. And he, interestingly, was a direct descendant of James Pym, who was the celebrated creator of the drink Pims, which I'm pretty sure Sri Lankans, and I know quite a few Indians, will um, be familiar with. And indeed, he... Um, uh, qualified with the Irish College in 1896 and was a surgeon uh, at Loughlin Hill Hospital uh, for 42 years and served the, the, the population of, of Ireland. Uh, so another great surgeon. But it is my view that um, uh, being an individual uh, does not actually lend yourself so well to a career in surgery. Um, it is more of a team a game and a team sport. So what about the team sports? And I suspect that some of you will recognize some of these uh, photographs. Uh, is there evidence amongst our members and fellows of sporting prowess? And I'm sure you will recognize Maya Gunasakira. Uh, he is a Sri Lankan surgeon and a reputed rugby personality. Uh, he was president of the Sri Lankan Rugby Football Union and also captained the Sri Lankan national team. And he was educated at the Royal College in Colombo, where he captained the first 15, went to um, uh, medical college in Colombo and got his degree and then got his master's of surgery degree from the Postgraduate Institute. I'm delighted to say that he's a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and he works as a consultant surgeon at the Nawaloka Hospital in Colombo. But also on this uh, slide is Philippe Contemponi on the left hand side, one of the famous sons of Irish, um, the Irish uh, Royal College. He was captain of Argentina and nominated for International Player of the Year in 2007. And he is uh, now a member of the Leinster Rugby Football te Coaching Team, but he um, qualified as an orthopaedic surgeon uh, relatively recently. And of course, the most recent uh, international, um, rugby international who was a surgeon is Niall Hogan, who is pictured here. Uh, he got 13 caps and also captained Ireland, and he is now an orthopaedic surgeon of significant 
Pute, specializing in knees and sports injuries. And back in the day, he happened to be touring South Africa with the Irish team and missed the conferring ceremony of his, of his graduation. And it was interesting that uh, the president of the college and a couple of senior council members, um, including Arthur Tanner, um, an ex-president, took themselves all the way to Cape Town to confer his degree personally. What a commitment, I would say. So, what else, what other evidence do we have? It does seem to be rugby um, when I go through all of this. And why? Well, it was amateur at the highest level in those days. And, and I think that that was a key to all of this. The great Jack Kyle up at the left-hand side in the black and white pictures, one of the greatest fly halves that's ever graced uh, any rugby pitch. He got his fellowship um, at the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in 1962, and he embarked on humanitarian surgical work in Sumatra and in Indonesia. And he finally worked for 34 years in, um, uh, in Zambia and provided a wonderful service there. And on the right hand side is a very famous surgeon called J.P.R. Williams. Um, he started his rugby career against my native team, Scotland, uh, in February 1969. And he had 55 caps and had a wonderful uh, career with the British Lions and with Wales. And he is also a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, elected here in May 1980. And one of my, our old ex-vice presidents told me once that JPR took a, a number of attempts to pass the fellowship. And when he was finally successful, Ian McLaren told him that he was reluctant to admit him to the Royal College of Zones of Edinburgh because he was someone who had done so much damage to Scotland <laughs> over the years. And it was interesting little aside about JPR. Um, he, towards the end of his career, was involved in a serious car accident and the car was a complete write-off. The tanker that he hit was a, a write-off, but JPR Williams came out of it all in one piece. And it was alleged that the hospital spokesman, uh, to report on how he was the next day, he said, Mr. Williams spent a comfortable night, but we were unable to save the lorry. So if we go through, we can see that there are fellows of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh who have been rugby internationals for many, many generations. Uh, and these were all Scottish um, uh, internationals who became surgeons, um, very celebrated surgeons. Uh, Charles Cathcart, William Stewart, um, Eldred Walls, Ernest Barmy, and William McLennan. And we even had an England rugby international, Lancelot Barrington Ward. We had Welsh JPR, as I said, and Barry Thomas, and Brian Windyer, who was uh, an Australian. And we also had an all black, Donald Stevenson, back in, um, uh, he played four times for the All Blacks in 1926 and got his fellowship at the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in 1935. So uh, there, are, there is significant evidence there um, to suggest that uh, there are plenty of rugby players and sportsmen that became surgeons. But if we move on to the third of the hypotheses, which is can surgery learn from elite sport? Um, so this paper by Verrier, um, looking at the elite athlete and the master surgeon, Sport is another human endeavor in which a long learning period of skill acquisition leads its player or its practitioner to the point in which putting such skills into practice is expected with the highest possible level of expertise. And in sport, just like in surgery, uh, one of the key outcomes is to be able to apply all that's been learned at a specific time and place. That is therefore, the performance that they put on and to do so as competently as possible. And I wouldn't be the first surgeon to point out that there are many similarities that surround both the surgical and the sporting performance, skill and ability under pressure. A surgeon often anticipates a difficult case or a challenging schedule in advance and his mind is already 
on what he will be doing from the night before and during the journey to the operating room. The changing room, I guess, is their locker room and the surgical greens are the team colours. Uh, by the time the procedure starts, the outside world, although it may not cease to exist, it really becomes pretty irrelevant. And I think that the, the, the things that I would bring together is that both sport and surgery attract talent. They both have instant decisions to make. Both have to focus their attention and minimize the external distractions. And both have to work in a team. And both are in the limelight and, and are exposed to scrutiny. And both have to deal with losing or loss. And both, without any doubt, need uh, passion and perseverance. But the difference, the difference between sport and surgery is sport is entertainment and surgery is relieving suffering and saving lives. So this paper by Gibney in the American Journal of Surgery in 2012 looked at uh, performance skills for surgeons. And what they highlighted was that the positive imagery is one of several mental skills that successful surgeons and athletes have in common. And they include distraction control, self-belief and constructive evaluation afterwards. Unfortunately, simply just teaching mental skills to surgeons in training will do very little to help them deliver an outstanding performance. We have to redesign our working lives to allow the mental preparation needed uh, for elite performance before we actually start an operation. I mean, it's unthinkable that, for instance, um, uh, one of the greats like Sachin Tendulkar of India uh, needed, uh, would take a call just before he's going in um, about anything that would be worrying or distracting uh, just before he goes into to, to, to bat. Uh, whereas uh, we do this all the time. That is exactly what surgeons are expected to do, dealing with multiple competing demands while preparing to operate, particularly on emergency cases. So perform like athletes, surgeons have got to prepare like athletes. And this means total focus on the case in hand and protecting time spent in the operating room from all other demands. So moving on, um, this paper, What Surgeons Can Learn from Athletes, uh, is, focuses on motivation. And motivation is the foundation of all athletic effort and accomplishment. And without the determination to improve performance, all other mental factors mentioned, such as confidence, uh, intensity, focus, as I mentioned before, emotion, control of emotions, are all meaningless. Athletes, and therefore surgeons, recognize the prime importance of motivation. True motivation has to come from within. It can't be taught. And I would leave you with this. And this was Calvin Coolidge, who was the, one of the American presidents in the 30s. And this is above all what I believe in. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. And just to finish off um, uh, with an anecdote, I will leave you with this. A dean of medicine from Ireland um, used to... Uh, try to predict um, what his class would end up doing in terms of, uh, of um, uh, medicine and specialties when they qualified in medicine. And he did it by using sport. I've said here the sorting hat, as some of you might be familiar with from Harry Potter. Um, and he looked, um, he, he made the case for hockey players. He said they were fit, they were honest, they were hardworking, um, and um, they were jacks of all trades, lots of skill sets, and they would go into general practice. 
And then he said cricketers, well, they do, they sit around a lot and nobody knows the rules. Um, what, nor do they know what you're talking about most of the time. And uh, a lot of the time they're asleep. And so it's anesthetics for cricketers. And soccer players or footballers, they go on and on about it. They talk about it. They pass the buck a lot. They blame others when they can. And they're off sick a lot. And uh, so they, they need to get into psychiatry. And snooker, well, snooker or billiards or pool, well, they're all very pale. They work in cellars and they're in the dark and they're usually on their own. They're all doing this same thing over and over again and so they really would go into uh, pathology and then the new kid on the block mixed martial arts um the newcomers i suppose to the table loud pushy uh, forcing change making the rules up as you go along well they've got to be medical educationists haven't they and golfers well loads of time to think uh, fussy pedantic um they only talk to each other it's got to be physicians for golfers. And then triathletes, well, they need the rest, so they go into radiology. Uh, and so I guess rugby, well, that's simple. Muscular, loud, um, hang around in a group. They like not their own company. No self-doubt. Uh, you'll have to have a go at anything um, as a rugby player. Optimists as well. Well, let's face it, we're all surgeons. So as I told you, um, uh, those are my thoughts about this. Oh, and finally, I should say that those totally uninterested in sport, don't play it, can't play it, don't want to watch it, well, no interest, well, it's politics for you. I've enjoyed talking to you. I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this talk and a quick view of sport and surgery. It's been a delight to be here. I wish you the very best for the Congress. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Mike, for that most thought-provoking and interesting talk. And we are of the College of Surgeons. I would like to thank you very much and wish you all the very best. And we end this session.